it. I mean, we are not seeing uh, the other electromagnetic. So, 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 I mean, this is a condition, a physical condition, and actually that should be taken account too. I mean, it's how the, the, our organism, our, the, the life was, I mean, the, I mean was allowed in, in our world that only use this narrow uh, band. I mean, it's something that intrigued me, but it, this is, the, the, this is was the, the only solution that was there. I mean, it's, it's very, I mean, it's a nice reflection and I think Helmholtz, when he's doing, I mean, in the point of view of the psychophysics, he talked a, a lot about this, this psycho, psychophysics and also the, the point of view of the energy of the photon, I mean, all of these uh, physical um, properties of light. You know? But uh, I haven't said nothing about the question, so we can see. <laughs> no, 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 that's a good point. That's a good uh, spin on the whole question. I mean, that is a very good question, this narrow band and why this particular narrow band. So it, it's far from trivial for sure. Yeah. And it's dubious, you know, whether you could even start talking about it intelligently from the strictly, say, phenomenological perspective that would not take into account. Uh, or again, it depends on how you construe the relationship between, say, uh, phenomenological and scientific. Uh, anyway, Evan, did you want to comment maybe on the Goethe? It, it seemed like that. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I in what Matt was saying, I heard maybe two questions. So one was specifically about Goethe and his, his way of thinking about theory and experience specifically with regard to color and how we might relate that to the discussion that's happening today. And then the, the second question, if I understood right, was a much in a way larger question about the relationship between science and experience, both I suppose you could say methodologically and metaphysically and how that relates to the inactive approach. Um, so if I parse the questions correctly, well, let me respond to the questions I just parsed and hopefully I parse them in the, in the right way. And if, if not, Matt can, can, uh, can refine or correct me. Um, so, I mean, the way that I read Goethe is, is as someone who in his dissatisfaction with Newton's theory insisted on what we might call the primacy of experience for our understanding of what color is. So this goes back to the question of, you know, what is color? Um, so it's the, it's, you know, Goethe insists on concrete visual experience and ways of, you could say, manipulating and exploring it within the phenomenological uh, domain as our touchstone for understanding what color is. And he objects to certain abstractive procedures and conceptions that, that Newton employs. And so I, I see Goethe as, in, you know, insisting on, you could say, the primacy of lived experience methodologically and epistemologically. And I, I think that's very important. I think he has, you know, I would say somewhat idiosyncratic ideas about the phenomenology in relation to his, you know, theoretical notions of archetypal phenomenon, or, you know, or phenomenon that he also has in his, you know, botanical work. Um, so it's not as if, you know, he's doing some kind of pure unadulterated phenomena, phenomenology. He has a conceptual system he's deploying in there as well. And I think that in, you know, in relation to our thinking today, um, some of his ideas are very rich and some of them are harder to work with. So the, you know, the archetypal phenomenon idea I think is harder to work with in the context of how we think about vision and visual experience today. That would be my own view anyway. Um, then with regard to the, the more general or the larger question, um, I, I, well, uh, let me come at it this way. So I personally think, I, I never use the term inactivism. Um, one, because I try to avoid ism thinking. And two, because we always spoke of the inactive approach. So we thought of it as, as a work in progress, 
as, as a way of approaching things that could encompass many different theories, many different models and, and different you know, philosophies. So I very much resist the idea that the inactive approach should be treated as a, as a, a way of um, pursuing things that needs to come to some you know, settled theoretical perspective or position in metaphysics. Um, that said, as a philosopher, my, my own inclination is to think that, um, that when we're talking about science, that, I mean, so I think of it in a sort of combination of Whitehead and Husserl maybe, that um, scientific laws are formal, idealized, abstract structures that are not concretely physically real and we shouldn't make the surreptitious substitution to use Husserl's words of thinking that the ideal and formal is concretely real in the way that say the lived experience of heat or the lived experience of color is. That's a kind of confusion. Um, at the same time, I think with Whitehead that experience and the growth of science out of experience is already abstractive. And when we pursue it in rigorous ways, it allows us to open up new domains of experience and new, new observables, new ways of intervening to manipulate things. Um, we enlarge our faculties of perception through technology and instrumentation. So I'm, I'm not, you know, um, I'm not an anti-realist about things like electrons, for example, because we can we can use electrons to do things. We can manipulate electrons. We can um, we can so they're different from mathematical abstract mathematical laws in that sense. Um, we can actually uh, we can actually deploy them experientially in a way that allows us to see their effects. So I see us as engaged in constantly opening up the horizon of experience through science and through technology, but we have to be careful not to, you know, fall into the fallacy of misplaced concreteness or the surreptitious substitution where we substitute the mathematical map for the concrete territory of nature. And then if you, you know, I think I saw in the chat, you said, well, for Whitehead, you know, energy is experiential, you know, the concrete reality of energy is experiential. Um, you know, I mean, I, I have some sympathy for that perspective, but I also think that there's a point at which that can become speculative in a way that I'm not as interested in for its own sake as a speculation. I'm interested in what a move like that will enable us to do in reconceptualizing what science is and how science works in ways that avoid things like, you know, misplaced concreteness and the surreptitious substitution. So that would be at least a, an attempt at a partial answer to what I heard your question as. Okay, thanks very much for this. Um, Natalie had a somewhat similar question and I would like to maybe do a little bit of an intro to that question because it relates to Merleau-Ponty and then she can, uh, continue in the direction she would like to take this question. So it's interesting that Goethe, who was for the most part shunned by scientists, was actually a great source of inspiration for the German neurologist called Kurt Goldstein, who wrote a really nice book, which in English is called The Organism. And uh, he, so Goldstein and some of the uh, um, psychologists coming from the Gestalt psychology circle, namely Katz and Werner particularly, have developed interesting studies on how, how color, the, the, the name, so the notion of color is a multidimensional concept and that usually when scientists focus on color, they just study what they called um, colored areas or surface colors. But they also pointed out that there are such things as colors of transparent objects, colors of lighting. So you, they use terminology that is very strange nowadays because people don't use it. But what, what is interesting is that they observed how colors, even for example, when you have 
what you call color change certain uh, phenomenological aspects. So the quality of the color changes, so the hue changes, and also the, the certain surface, surface characteristic changes. There remain certain constancies with regards to the bodily response. So how the organism as a whole responds to what Merleau-Ponty then calls the atmosphere of color. And I would like to read one quote from Merleau-Ponty, maybe, you know, as a topic of discussion. I'll also put it in, uh, in, in the chat and then uh, maybe Na uh, uh, Natalie can add something to this. He talks about um, mm, when you have a fountain pen, which is black, and then uh, you say, put it into uh, uh, under a very bright light, but it's still black, although it has changed profoundly. It is basically illuminated. And this is the way he phrases it. And I find it very interesting. And I also think that this is the reason why, for instance, approaches such as Goethe, which seem to be antagonistic to the classical scientific approach, can be very useful if you think about them you know, uh, deeply and try to integrate them into what you're doing as a scientist. Because again, Kurt Goldstein developed a whole notion or understanding of color by drawing on Goethe. So this is, uh, this is the quote. Um, we shall not succeed in understanding perception unless we take into account a color function which may remain even when the qualitative appearance is modified. I say that my fountain pen is black and I see it as black under the sun's rays. But the blackness is less the sensible quality of blackness than a somber power which radiates, over the, radiates from the object, even when it is overlaid with reflected light and it is visible only in the sense in which moral blackness is visible. And I, and I quote this um, intentionally. It's somewhat poetic, but I think it has a very uh, strong evocative appeal so that there is something to colors where you have these constancies that are not necessarily related to certain external factors. Of course, this is something that you emphasize in the ecological approach. But uh, again, it brings us back to the question about what is color and this multidimensionality of color, both in the phen phenomenal realm and also in the physical realm. So Natalie, I don't know if you, if you can somehow tie into this and then maybe uh, Adrian can say what he thinks about these questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. Well, you said much more than what I had in mind first. So thank you for the uh, quote, which is really uh, very, very nice. And always difficult with Nardo Ponti because uh, as you said, uh, he's well, a poetic man and uh, sometimes more suggestive than really uh, very, uh, well, it's, uh, it's very detailed, but you sometimes don't know exactly what, uh, what it means in a sense. So um, that's the charm of the thing as well. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's great. What I had in mind actually was, uh, well, the, 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 the very small sentence I, I, I wrote on the chat was about the fact that uh, uh, we are uh, very uh, usually discussing between uh, uh, the perceiver and the perceived. And even though the inactive approach uh, uh, wants to uh, um, well to to bring about an, uh, another level beyond uh, subjectivism and objectivism, as uh, Adrian uh, showed it in the in the paper. Uh, still, we have these two aspects, and we um, and it's uh, what what I found interesting in Merleau Ponty's view, um, and it applies to colors, uh, of course, is that uh, he uh, he puts a kind of inverted uh, perspective. Uh, into play because he uh, he will he would say that uh, we I don't perceive uh, colored uh, surfaces and colors, but the colors come to me. The color come to me, and the colored uh, surface and uh, um, uh, comes to me or in, immerses me. So, uh, and uh, I think it's interesting to have in mind this kind of inversion. I don't know if it's uh, possible in a scientific perspective to. Uh, find uh, the analogy. <laughs> uh, so I, I won't be able to, to, uh, to go on, the, on this uh, way. But uh, what's interesting is that Merleau Ponty actually was very, um, it was mentioned on the chat with uh, some, some painters, but he was very much influenced by uh, Paul Cézanne, uh, namely. 
and uh, he wrote a text uh, uh, called Le Doute de Cézanne, and uh, especially in this uh, influence, uh, in Cézanne's influence, he was very much uh, um, interested by the way Impressionists were uh, painting and how the color and the light uh, was very much, uh, um, uh, they were not looking at the, at the landscape, but the landscape was already coming to them. So, well, uh, 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 this inversion uh, of perspectives, uh, I think it's interesting to have it in mind in order to, uh, to understand maybe also what he says when he says about the, when he talks about the, the, the vibration or the prismatic aspect of colors, um, not only as content, but uh, as a broader, broader, way of, of being being immersed, immersed, how the subject is immersed by by the colors and not not the reverse, not only the reverse, let's say. So that, that's what I, I, I had in mind actually. So I don't know if it helps or if it brings anything <laughs> on the in the in, in the discussion that um it does Natalie, <laughs> thank you. So Adrian any comments, thoughts yeah, on that? May, may, maybe I can try to com comment because I agree. I mean, this is a uh, nice point of view about the, I mean, the, the, the perception in general about colors. Uh, and, I, and I think it, one of the, I mean, one of the facts that I think if we can talk about fact is that you never have colors, I mean, directly from the energy point of view of any, any stimuli say that you have photons, but you, you, I mean, your brain, they don't receive photon directly. I mean, it need to be transduced. I mean, there are no way to create any experience or naming of colors that you wanna do this after. I mean, many, many networks that you're gonna, you're gonna be working together and uh, because you don't have access directly to this moment, that is color directly, I mean, from the energy point of view, I mean, you're gonna go, I mean, for, this is the, 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 the jobs, you know, of sensor proteins that they wanna catch the energy, then you're gonna change the structure of this protein that's gonna be more able just to, to, to let down, I mean, let en enter some ions and then you're gonna have a liberation of some a vesicle and the vesicle is going to help to to go to one synapsis communication with another neuron another one another one and then you are in in the brain you know with this mixing areas that start to talking together just to to put something that is called language or i mean so related to to the color so i mean this is something that is very important because that, that the plasticity, the richness of the neural network, I mean, is something that you are using to, 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 to make sense of, of this uh, stimuli. In that sense, nothing, I mean, that has been mentioned before by, by Natalie or Evan, I mean, surprised me in the term of the, each one tuning his own I mean, uh, I say training of his own brain and body in the world. I mean, they want to have his own experience. And that I, I just have showed this, this paint, the painter that is a woman that has an extra uh, sensor. Then he has a completely different um, sensation experience with with what we call colors, you know, and it's something that is depending you know, uh, uh, in your own visual system. Color, for example, is you, you are monochromatic. You have one one sensor that covers the whole wavelength, and you cannot compare with other one. You wanna look at everything like brightness, you know, between black and white. And, and, and that, that, that doesn't mean you don't want to have a nice experience of the world with very nice differentiation, which is gray, you know, the steps, you know, it's going to be also wonderful, but it doesn't want to be similar that just put some color on that, you no? Know? That, that, that I think I, I, this is my, I mean, 
feeling that uh, there's these levels that was mentioned in the wave of colonies, I mean, level of the uh, analysis, the level of organization, levels, levels of operation, uh, is something that when you try to, to track this problem of the color, you face on that, you face with that, you face where you wanna be looking at. And then it's, it's like a checklist. I mean, you, you are gonna be this, this, I mean, this level is neuron, network, brain, behavior. And uh, it's sometimes it's very difficult to make the link, you know, to associate the dependency of the a level that is very molecular to one that is more neural network to the then behavior and then to the experience of all of this together. I mean, this is something that for me is an open question today. Um, Adrian, uh, by the way, uh, I forgot to mention that the, the, the question uh, um, about G uh, Goldstein was also partly posed by Eva. So uh, it's, it, it's deemed fitting to, to mention or explicate this. So uh, I tried to combine several questions together, but uh, I would like to uh, maybe ask you, you know, this idea of actually being somehow drawn in by the color or the color uh, taking over you in a certain sense. And this was also something that was mentioned by Gestalt psychologist and Goldstein, where you have levers of color, which basically are not so much related to you perceiving a certain quality, but evoking in you a certain bodily attitude. Would you say that this is uh, related to the notion of co-determination, which lies at the very center of the experiential and ecological approach that you're trying to develop, and if so, I would like to um, ask you whether you could maybe try to spell out a bit more this idea, so to, to, to flesh it out, the notion of co-determination. And in particular, I would like to actually pose a question that I found in one of the comments. It was made by Brooks. I don't know whether that is uh, the correct pronunciation, correct pronunciation. It's on page 31. And the, the, the question that he poses is, what is the nature of this co-determination? Is this a causal process or a constitutive process? Because this is a very, very important question. Again, maybe a bit more interesting to, to a philosopher, but still, I think it's an important one. So this idea that, you know, the color evokes in me a specific behavioral attitude, which then, in turn, enables me to open up to certain other dimensions of space among other things, certain bodily, it seems to be closely connected with the co-determination. So maybe some thoughts on that. And uh, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on co-determination and what type of a relationship uh, basically are we talking yeah. about here? Yeah, I think one of the thoughts that I can have in that, that can be in terms of the, I mean, the, the, who, this co-determination is, is when, when you start to talking about this, is this, you are, we are, facing in animal that has been living in the in the hills i mean in the in this world for thousand a couple of million of years and then they have start to develop in some some um, coupling with the this world because i mean they they need to survive in the, in this one this is more like a, something that is there are some example of that i mean in the sense that what about the evolution of color signals in flowers and insect pollination? Also, pollination you can extend this to primates because they they take some fruit. You know, they need to take this to just to pollinize, pollinize to make the pollination. So, in that sense, maybe this co, I mean, co determination is much easier uh, to 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 try to explain. I mean, you, you have more argument on that because you can, you can just use some data. The, the other one is called determination in terms of the, what is the experience of the color in yourself? And, and then to, to talk, to come back, to look at in a new way in the world, I mean, that you are facing on, this is more related to the human experience in that sense that you can have this, I mean, use that in terms of the painting artists is what they do. I mean, they, they experience color and they use color permanently 
in terms of looking more, going out, so you are an impressionist, expressionist, or I mean, shaping the world in another way, using more tools, looking new, eventually new mixing colors, you know, just, just to, to create an, a, a different experience of that, because you are working on that. I mean, you are feeling colors, but you are working maybe in color and you have the time and the resources just to, to dedicate to this area of, of arts. And, and I think this is, is a subject in itself. And I think, yes, I mean, using your language, your own intuition, sensitivity, all of these aspects, I mean, make you and an, an that has a human is something that is, 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 is very normal that this happened. I don't see any equivalent of this in the non-primate, you know, I mean, that's you really uh, use color li like a dimension that actually can create, I mean, it's very difficult to study that. So, so the, this is, I think it's a gap there, a very strong gap in the area of um, biology in experiment to, I mean, just to, to, create, to, to make the, the bond or to link between the, these two aspects. But uh, yes, I mean, for me, it's make all of the sense what Natalie and you mentioned about the, the if color can just, you be using just for your own progress, your own development, you are going on grow like, like, like human. Yeah, I mean, it's something that you can use like a concept every, every time, I mean, all of the time. And, people that paint, I have some experience with people that use color just to, to create things. They talk all the time about color, the use of color, I mean, the different tones of color. And uh, I say the, the example of this person that I, I mentioned that has an tuning, an extra photoreceptor that is enough, you know, to create a new concept of art, you know, the how they paint because she paints using, I mean, colors in that sense, you, you are substrate just to paint things that you are not seeing yourself. So did this make a nice discussion about what she is saying? She is experienced uh, the people that see the same painting. They say, okay, here is something that I don't understand, but this corresponds to an, the experience of this painter. So this is, an, I think, is something that can help to the discussion of about this uh, color, like a vector of growing yourself, you know, and using this for this code determination. But I think it's more like I don't, I don't know his nature in that sense. In the case of human, can be taken like a, for a code determination. We live, you know, in cities, you know. <laughs> In cities, I mean, that are not the, the, the nature like we think when, when we are talking about co-determination, you know, nature, environment, the ecological, everything that does make little sense for human in this moment of his history, you know. I mean, we are like in another world in this moment, like, like, like animals you know like like <laughs> we are not interacting in that way we are more i mean cognitive drive i mean we are thinking about we are thinking about in a, in i mean outside of the nature most of people i don't say that they are not people that live in nature directly but i think it's very difficult to i mean <clears throat> to talk about this area in for directly in human Yes, thank you very much. Any any thoughts on that? Any comments on this? Co-determination. I saw that some people were writing in the chat. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, uh, maybe just to yeah. say what, what I what I said in the chat that uh, uh, maybe co-creation would be a, a, a more a dynamic word as co-determination, which is uh, a limiting a limiting uh, expression. Well. Uh, maybe it's the two sides of the same process, but um, um, one more uh, active and also receptive and the other one more static. I don't know. Uh, 
one one thing that uh, ties into this, I think, and it's very important, um, is the question that I've posed about the the what type of a relationship we have here, whether it is a, a causal relationship or um, internal relationship, of course, so of a co constitutive relationship. So this might seem like a unimportant thing or some you know uh, philosophical technicality, but it's not actually. It's a uh, it has very profound and strong implications because if there is only causal interrelation, interrelation, you still are dealing with two separate entities of sorts that are somehow discrete, that are separate from one another, organism and its environment, however the environment is constituted, and then they causally interact. So there is no internal connection between the two, but there is also a stronger way of reading this and this is the way of reading that Whitehead would adhere to, that I think that Francisco in a would agree with. Uh, and uh, you also find similar ideas in Merleau-Ponty when he talks about mutual implication. And that is that the organism and its world are internally interrelated in the sense of mutually co-constituting one. So they're constituting one another. So they, they are in a certain sense a part of a broader whole that somehow contains them, not contains, that's not the proper, but that, and they, they would be two aspects of this broader whole. And one way of picturing it is uh, the, the, the image I constantly mention and people who have heard my talks probably hate by now uh, is the figure against the background <laughs> in Gestalt psychology, where you basically, if you want to have a figure, you have to have a background. And it's not like, you know, you can just forget about the background. No, you have to have it. So they are mutually implicatory. So in order to, for you to have one, you need the other. And the relationship between those two is internal in the sense of the meaning of figure is co-determined by the background and vice versa. And the point that, for example, Merleau-Ponty was making, and I think that Francisco was also trying to make in different ways, is that there is this type of relationship. And this has really profound impact on, first of all, how you go about construing science. And I also think that if more scientists knew about this more radical reading, I would venture to guess that they would be more nervous and hesitant to engage in these types of interdisciplinary uh, collaborations. To be quite honest, I think that for the most part, when they hear co-determination, they just think, yeah, okay, well, so you have the world out there, you have the organism here somehow, and then they interact circularly. So in a circular fashion, what you do is you just kind of add a little bit of intrigue to, to the whole story. But if you really try to spell out the implications of this, it really changes the way you see reality as such. So, uh, yeah, any comments or thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe if I... Okay, uh, Natalie I and then Adrian <laughs> and others. Uh, I think you, you could really uh, uh, reformulate it also in, uh, in very uh, simple Husserlian words uh, and... Uh, uh, having on one side what what Husserl would would call correlation, uh, which means that you are uh, well, you have two aspects and you try to figure out uh, how to uh, bring about a unity. And uh, Husserl himself talks about co-constitution, and in that uh, respect, you already have something far more uh, uh, not not a previous unity, but something that. Uh, uh, that will, uh, uh, in the same way as uh, Francisco, uh, as I said uh, the last time, uh, talks about the fold as a, uh, something that's uh, really uh, 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 at the same time two sides and the two sides are uh, working together and they don't exist one uh, without the other. So they need, they have this line which is uniting them, but which doesn't pre-exist but it, emerge, it emerges at the same time as the two sides appear. So you have this kind of dynamic unity. And I think that uh, when Husserl talks about co-constitution, he means exactly that in a sense. So it's uh, far more integrative in a sense. And uh, well, it, it goes in the same way as what you were saying, but uh, 
But I think Francisco was exactly there. Uh, and I, I just uh, quoted this uh, article in, uh, in Alter when he speaks of generative passages. So he goes even further, uh, not speaking only on, of contents, generative contents, but uh, generative passages, which means that there is this dynamic uh, 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 going and going uh, ever and ever. And, um, Okay, yes, very good. Thank you very much, Natalie. These are very illuminating comments and uh, extensions. Uh, Adrian? Yes, uh, just a comment on that, that maybe this is open a new, I mean, area of discussion, but I mean, in that sense that the, maybe we're, there, there's different timing scaling. I mean, but one is the million of years where you can see this co-evolution, co-determination in terms of flower selection, insect or bird that change some genomes, you know, you need to change your genome, you need to make mutation just to, to start to be in calling, we are co-adapting. But this is one, one issue. And, but if you just take, I, I had not the time to, 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 to put more in that in the presentation, the time, but if you take other aspects like, like the how your uh, nervous system, brain essentially is changing in your life with aging, with any uh, pathological affection, or taking just aging, you know, aging is something that is a slow process where everything is changing all the time. So you're gonna end up with, with a brain that has other cells, has less uh, plasticity. So your experience of anything that is called color vision is gonna be different in the sense that it's gonna be, you're gonna be affecting color experience with memory, you maybe you're gonna lose a little bit memory, you're gonna lose some plasticity in your neural network, you're gonna be losing things. But you know, this is something that is, is also in your lifetime. That in that sense, co-determination is, is gonna be maybe looking at inside yourself. In that time, how your brain, your capacity, you know, to generate this relation with the world is changing, but it's maybe it's gonna be more in your side because biology is, is taking, I mean, it's gonna be, each day is gonna be uh, aged, you know, the aging is gonna be, be taking place in your brain and then you're gonna die sometime <laughs> after that. So you are losing capacity. You know, you are having other things, but you are losing some the, the capacity eventually that you was having when you you were you born, you know, in the in the beginning. So maybe this is something to be studied during the ontogeny of the human being. How you are being really, I mean, uh, determinate, co-determinate with your world, but following you up yourself, describing your own experience how I feel, why I don't remember names, what, what, what this color seems very different to, to what I remember, so, you know, this kind, uh, this is the, what I said, because the, the way of coloring, the, the example that they put was in a million year scale, you know, this is evolutionary time. So this co-determination is not maybe the same that we are talking now, you know, it's, it's very different and also, food, epigenetics, all of this uh, change your brain every day, your bioma. I mean, you know, also see, determinate how you are in the in sense of, I mean, all of this internal, I mean, vector can also, is, is, are shaping your self penment, your, your immune, immune system. But maybe this is something that that's what I say, this open up for me a, a new area of discussion because it's very interesting, but I would separate, you know, this co-determination in the sense of the way of coloring that was very concrete in terms of the insect pollinization, color of flowers. This is one, one of the exa example of maybe the discussion that is more like we are having now, you know. 
Yes, thank you, Adrian. That's a very good point. I started uh, uh, this uh, Q and A uh, section by saying that uh, color is one of those fundamental phenomena that tends to be overlooked, but uh, uh, it also draws many of the people who see that there's something wrong with certain prevailing conceptions or approaches within science and maybe certain other epistemic disciplines. Um, and definitely time is another such phenomenon. It's also easy to just think, uh, uh, say that we already know what time is, but the, the truth is that there's, there's also, there are so many different dimensions and layers to the phenomenon of time that it also constantly pops up uh, in, in discussions uh, um, that normally revolve around uh, issues with prevailing uh, paradigms. And this notion and question of temporality of taking a processual approach instead of having a static approach. So this uh, dynamic way of thinking or seeing things is uh, very interesting indeed. Unfortunately, we're slowly moving towards the end of today's session. So maybe if anybody has last, a last comment or a quick question, I would prefer a comment if I'm being honest <laughs> at this point. Yes, Evan. Well, maybe just a comment on the constitutive causal question that you raised, because I think it's interesting. I think it would be helpful to go back to Francisco's star perspective from not one, not two, and think about that very distinction in terms of the star perspective, because the distinction between causal and constitutive is actually context dependent and relative to a frame of investigation and shouldn't be set up oppositionally. So if you remember the network that Francisco uses in Not One, Not Two to illustrate the star, you can think of the branching tree structure as a temporally ordered causal process where A affects B and B affects C and C affects D. So there you're looking at the network in terms of causal processes that you're mapping out in time. But when you think of them all as interfolded and entangled in a complex network, then they're constitutive of the network and they form a unity. And so what we're doing when we talk about cause and constitution is we're emphasizing different analytic perspectives on phenomena that form entangled holes and that we, we cut, to use Francisco's language, in, in various ways. And in the concrete case of color, you could say, well, over the vast time scale of evolutionary history, you have flower pigmentations forming that causally affect through light reflections, the selective, you know, um, histories of you know reproducing insects and organisms so that you have this you know temporal causal back and forth that's to look at it from a causal perspective over evolutionary time but of course if you then look at the organism and environment as coupled systems with constant reciprocal causation you treat them as a whole ecological unity and then you're looking at it constitutively. So it, it, it's a question of what question we ask and how we want to look at really ultimately at time in a way. And um, there, I think, you know, we should remind ourselves of the, of the star perspective and not, and not oppose the causal and the constitutive. Yes, I want things. That's, that's a very good point. Uh, I think that, one of the things that seem to be lacking, however, is precisely this network image, network picture. This was usually somehow uh, downgraded in contemporary approaches, although one could argue that uh, these types of uh, approaches are now um, 
having some sort of a renaissance or revival as well. And we talked about about uh, Whitehead last time, and he seems to be a really, really good example of doing something like that, trying to conceive of uh, these. Uh, so the, the most fundamental questions, uh, philosophical questions that pertain also to what science is doing from this very dynamically network uh, perspective. Um, that's one thing. So basically working on these perspectives, uh, developing them, discussing them, and then also convincing scientists <laughs> that, you know, there is this interrelation between the network and the more linear uh, way of approaching things and uh, presenting these two approaches in a way, uh, star cybernetics would be one, one way of doing it. Um, that would make sense to them and that would convince them that you're not basically um, in any way um, uh, degrading or shunning or whatever that the scientific approach, uh, in fact, that you're actually extending and improving it in significant ways. Anyway, uh, at this point, I would uh, um, suggest that we close for today. Thank you all for joining. Adrian, thank you so much for a nice presentation, for very interesting uh, um, responses and comments. And thanks to everybody else who either uh, contributed in the, in the discussion actively or just uh, served as a constitutive background <laughs> to the figure that was unfolding. And as we said, they are mutually implicatory. So we can't say that one is more important than the other. So thanks to everyone. Be well. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh.